with welfare numbers in sharp decline, things couldn't be better for New York City, or so our politicians proclaim. But they are telling us only half the story. I'm David R. Jones, president of the Community Service Society of New York, a nonprofit organization that has been tracking poverty for more than 150 years. Today, the urban agenda will look at how people forced to take low-wage jobs are fa faring once they leave the welfare rolls. We have as our guest a distinguished cultural anthropologist and professor of urban study at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, Catherine S. Newman. Her latest book, No Shame in My Game, examines the lives of 300 workers and job seekers at four fast food outlets in Harlem. Ms. Newman, welcome to Thank the you. Urban Agenda. This Thank is a critical issue for, for many of us looking at poor people in New York. Uh, what were, were the findings of your book? To summarize, what were the critical findings that you made? I think for the purposes of this program, the most important thing I found was how hard it is to find a job in the inner city and how hard people are trying to find work. Those are two stereotype-busting findings right. that I think we need to pay attention to. In central Harlem, in the fast food industry, there are 14 applicants for every available job. And that's a long line of people standing out the door who are going to be disappointed, who will not get those jobs. And as a result, we see wage stagnation, which would persist if it weren't for increases in the minimum wage that are mandated. Mm -hmm. Because with so many people looking for work, there's no real incentive for wages to rise. So you have a permanent group of people who are held down in the category of the working poor. Well, of those 14 to 1, uh, what were the characteristics of those who didn't get the jobs? Well, one thing I found out was that they were experienced workers. They had experience These were this. not new entrants to the labor market. These were people who had already clocked several years' worth of work experience. They had applied for an average of seven to eight jobs before they came looking for these fast food jobs, which are really at the bottom of the unskilled labor market. Uh, they were people who had somewhat less education than those who were successful at getting the jobs. Mm -hmm. But remember, the jobs themselves that they were after were entry-level minimum wage jobs. These are the jobs we typically associate with teenagers who are just starting out in the labor market. I found that in general adults were better able to get those jobs in central Harlem. So the youngsters who are looking to get a foot in the door and establish a track record were having a very difficult time doing so. Now the time for this study actually was before the first bite of welfare reform. That's right. In fact this study had nothing to do with welfare reform. My interest was in shifting our definition of poverty or our public perception of right. poverty away from welfare and toward the working poor who have always been larger in number than the people who are on public assistance. Well, the, clearly the working poor with time limits coming up in December of 2001 will be the only way that That's people right. can sustain themselves. But they've been with us for a very long time. We just haven't been very interested in their lives. Now, now talk to me a little bit about our benefits. I, I get my job at, at the, the fast food place. What, what kind of benefits am I entitled to once I get that job? There are no benefits associated with these minimum wage jobs. And in fact, you may lose benefits that might have been uh, given to you when you were on public assistance. So Medicaid becomes much harder to get because now you're earning too much to access Medicaid. And it's not much that you're earning. Right. Um, so you have no benefit, no vacation, no medical care, nothing is associated with these jobs. But you do have a regular income, right. and you have the dignity of being a worker, and that's not an unimportant quality for these people. Now, you don't, you, you're not unionized, obviously, no. so if you can be terminated on the spot? Yes, and in fact, what I found was most people lost hours before they lost their jobs. So the jobs just became unviable. If you start out with a part-time job and what you really want, what you're really desperate for, are full-time hours, instead you sometimes find your hours are cut as the, you know, if the custom will not bear enough. So when we look at, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how robust the New York City economy is, um, driven by Wall Street. And clearly there's been some trickle down to sort of food serving uh, areas. But I assume when the economy starts to slow, I don't know what the history has been, but I don't think fast food does necessarily well. But fast food is somewhat impervious to these really. changes, but I think it is the case that in pockets of deep poverty, which we do have here in New York City, 
the uh, booming economy hasn't completely trickled down. We still have very high, nearly double the levels of unemployment in these communities that you would see citywide. Mm -hmm. And the boom in Wall Street, of course, has catalyzed increases in expenses, increasing rents, uh, which make it that much more difficult for people at the minimum wage level to survive in the city. But it certainly is helpful. The best medicine for the working poor is a tight labor market. Right. The problem is it's not so tight, or it's not tight everywhere. And if we see uh, rising opportunities for people who are well educated, who are in the high tech industries or in the financial services industries, that doesn't necessarily have a beneficial effect for people at the very bottom of the educational scale. Give, give the audience a, a profile of one of the 300 people you, you talked to. I mean, first of all, were they willing to talk so easily about what they were going through? Well, the one you know, key benefit of being an anthropologist, I find, is that people, who, ordinary people, are very happy to talk about their lives. No one ever asks them how they feel about anything or <laughs> what their experience has been like. And so if you do, make an effort. In general, I found people to be quite willing, and both the business owners that I studied and the workers and the managers were actually quite open with me and my research team. Let me tell you about a few of them. I'll start with Kaisha. These are all, by the way, fake names, names. so to speak, to protect the privacy of the people who, who were generous with their time. Right. Kaisha was 21 years old when I met her. She had been working for five years for a fast food uh, restaurant. So she started working when she was underage. She right. lied about her age to get the job. She actually works two jobs. She works there, and she also has a job cleaning up around the housing project where she works because she needs two jobs in order to support her son. She lives with her mother. Her mm -hmm. mother has been a welfare recipient for about 25 years now. And so this is a typical arrangement. People who are on welfare often have workers in their households, right. and low-wage workers often have access to someone who's receiving benefits because neither welfare nor a low-wage job will permit people to survive in an expensive city like this. Mm. It takes a pooling of that income in families in order for the families to survive at all. So Kaisha had been working for five years. She was earning about $5 an hour after five years. That is to say, that was it. the bounce you get for staying long term in one of these jobs is very modest indeed. Um, there's really not much payoff until you reach a managerial level. The good thing about these industries is they do promote people off the shop floor. Mm -hmm. They are actually very good about that. But you can only pro promote so many people. Right. Most people come and go in a cycling pattern. Kaisha, however, had stuck it out and had been there a long time. She was supporting a child who was about two years old when I met her. Her, the child's father was also contributing support to that child, although he didn't live with the family. And that's an important finding. Men who have jobs are much more likely to provide support for their children. And this young man did so consistently to his child, even though he didn't live with him. Mm -hmm. um, she was someone who was faithful to her job, who actually felt like the job was the center of her life. Hmm. Now, this sounds odd to us, thinking about a fast food business, but the truth is that's where her friends were. That's where the people she trusted were. And so even when she had days off, she came in to work. And people would say, Kaisha, don't you have something else you'd rather <laughs> do? And she'd say, you know, this is where I'm happiest, right. where I'm working. So one of the things I found in this book, and was true in all of their lives, was that work was really central to their sense of dignity and purpose in life, right. even when that job was something that was stigmatized by the rest so of So the conservatives were, are right, and I think many of us in, in the sort of welfare do-goody side have agreed to that. It's certainly my memory of growing up in Bed-Stuy is the same. The notion of work was everything. Here's where I think the conservatives go wrong, and maybe the liberals go wrong as well. Right. We have assumed that that ethic was dead in the inner city. And what I found was that inner city families are about as mainstream as the middle class families commuting into the city. They want the same things for their families. They don't have the same opportunity structure. They don't have the same education. They, don't face, they face some barriers that others don't face, racial barriers, mm -hmm. educational barriers. But if we're just talking about what they want for their lives, what they want is a decent job. Right. And they're willing to work harder, perhaps, than some of the rest of us do at jobs that pay less to get there. And, and tell me, what, what about health benefits? How did Kaisha and her family uh, deal Kaisha with that? Kaisha spent many a day in the emergency room because she no longer qualified for Medicaid. Uh, she had quite a struggle actually getting her child onto Medicaid. Hmm. She did finally do that. And she had some serious health problems. And this is true of many people who are poor, uh, including the working poor. Chronic illnesses like diabetes, 
asthma for children have been rising in poor communities. But health care was not readily available, and so she would have to pay for it out of her pocket. And she didn't have a regular doctor. She would be in the emergency room. And, and I, that made these conditions probably that much more threatening. And she had to take off from work, I assume. You don't get paid for Often she had to take off from work, or she just had to fit it around her schedule. But more problematic was what it cost her. It was significant. And the quality of the care. This is not someone who's getting preventive medicine. This is someone right. who's getting emergency treatment. And, and what about the child care arrangements for her child? How did that work? Well, this was quite interesting. In her family, her mother, who we could say has been on welfare all of this time, really might be thought of as a state-funded child care worker, worker because what her mother was doing was taking care of Kaisha's child along with her own children. And this is what many working poor families mm -hmm. have to do. They rely on people who are on welfare, who are really an un unregulated labor force in the child care industry. Right or the, the kindness of, of friends. They tend not to use formal child care agencies. They are somewhat suspicious of the quality. Often they just don't know about what's mm -hmm. available to them. And child care is a very big problem because these jobs tend to have rolling shifts, night obligations, and you can have everything worked out child care wise and then it'll all fall apart when your schedule changes. And that is a very serious problem for the working poor. When, when you talked to her, what, what was her vision for the future? Where was she going? What was she trying to do for her family? The future was a very cloudy one from her point of view. What she really wanted was to become an independent adult. But I found this to be typical of people who were in their mid-20s and working these low-wage jobs. They really couldn't see when they were going to be able to break free of their natal families. They were dependent for child care on their mothers they needed a roof over their heads because they really couldn't pay for that. Uh, so Section 8 housing was very important, but wasn't accruing to them personally. Right. And so this issue of adult life, adult independence, was weighing very heavily on them, and it made the future very difficult to predict. For the young women, many of them wanted to get married. That's what they wanted. They realized if they got married, they would be able to pool income and, and have something closer to an adult life. But that, uh, you know, sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't work out. That's what Kaisha wanted more than anything, I think. She, she wanted to get married. Uh, why did you choose this particular industry? I mean, as you, as you looked at low-wage jobs, there's garment industry, there's healthcare work. Why, low, why fast food? All of those other industries are important, and there needs to be many more books like this one that investigate them. But if we were thinking about what is the prototypical low-wage job, and I don't just mean what par people think of in a stereotyped way, but just at the numbers, we would find the fast food industry is the largest employer of entry-level workers. And it's by far the largest employer of minority youth. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought I was going to be looking at youth. It turned out, as I said, youth adults. had a hard time getting these jobs. But I chose this industry because it actually is representative in an important way of the low-wage labor force. But it's not the only industry where this is the case. Had many of the 300 been on uh, welfare before coming into the fast food industry? About a quarter of the total population had someone in their household who was receiving public aid. But that could be SSI. Right. That could be all, you know, all kinds of Social Security. Um, so actually, this was a group of people who had had episodic contact with the welfare system. Some of them had. Most of them, however, were very firmly attached to the labor force, but at the low wage level. So and now we're on the eve of a, of a new experiment. Right. Uh, I assume if you're distanced from it, you can feel it's experimental. Uh, we're going to uh, sharply diminish or eliminate uh, benefits to large numbers of people after December of 2001. What, what does your study seem to indicate for that kind of transition? How smooth or, or rocky is this going to be? I think we have a difficult time assessing this. First, we aren't really collecting the information that we need uh, in the city to assess this. And, and we need a better information collection system just to be able to answer your question accurately. But here are the things I would predict will be positive and the things that will be negative. On the negative side, if you already had four, a 14 to 1 ratio of job seekers to people who were successful getting jobs before welfare reform, this is the labor market to which most long-term welfare recipients will turn when they look for work. And I would predict that they won't be absorbed in it. They weren't, job seekers were not being absorbed in this labor market to begin with before we had welfare reform. If you compare, as I do in the book, the qualifications of long-term welfare recipients with the qualifications even of the unsuccessful job seekers in my book, you find out long-term welfare recipients are less qualified. Hmm. They have less education. 
they have less recent work experience. And so I would predict they're going to be at the bottom of the queue, and that queue is a very long queue. Right. As a result, for those people who are already in the labor force, I think we're going to see wage stagnation. Unless the Democratic Party rallies the forces to increase the minimum wage, because only a ma legally mandated increase right. is going to translate into any real income increases for the working poor. I think as well, I am, I am concerned about what will happen to city services that make it possible for the working poor to go to work. For example, child care. Even mm -hmm. though many of these people were in the unregulated family side, right. those who had formal child care, I think may be at risk uh, because the city has an incentive to take people off the welfare rolls and provide them with child care. And they deserve it. This is not a question of who deserves and who doesn't right. deserve. But there is an incentive built in there because they want to see the rolls decline. There isn't as powerful an incentive for people who are already in the labor force to retain the child care slots they have. After mm -hmm. all, they're not a social problem Rob for us Money to more. worry about. So I think the child care issues will be quite uh, profound. All the way around, we will not know what welfare reform will bring to New York City uh, until we get a better fix on the long-term future of the labor market. We mm -hmm. are enjoying, despite the problems in places like Harlem or Bedford-Stuyvesant, a very healthy economy right now. In general, what goes down usually comes up. We have had no experience with these long-run booms that didn't come to an end at some point. And then we will see, I think, what we've really wrought with welfare reform. I think it's hard to know right now. If, if suddenly the, the, the Democratic or the Republican Party gets a, a, you know, a, a, a major set, set of religion and puts you in a policymaking <laughs> position uh, to handle the transition, what would you focus on from the, based upon your study? I think two things I would focus on at the outset are increases in the minimum wage and increases in the earned income the tax, tax credit, credit, which is by far the least expensive, least bureaucratic, and most effective way to put more money in the hands of right. poor workers. We do need to work on job creation because merely enhancing the wages of those who are working will not provide new jobs. I think the jury's out on the um, incentives and program, programs that we have, uh, like the redevelopment zones and, and the empowerment zones, but I'm hopeful about what they might bring. Certainly in central Harlem, we have seen some major commercial development that simply hadn't been there for the previous 10 years. We'll have to see how that pans out. What about the notion of trying to actually focus on, on job creation that is for the low-wage market? We haven't in New York for... Uh, since the 60s, I think the last real efforts to support sort of semi-skilled and unskilled manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about those ideas? Have you seen in your studies any, any parts of the nation I where really there's... Ha the only places where I've seen a revival of manufacturing are in the Midwest, where there has been a resurgence right. of manufacturing. Those jobs do tend to be higher wage. However, manufacturing jobs now also require more education and skill than they used to. Well, let's talk about that. They what, require uh, quality control skills. Workers on the, on the line in the auto plants now are expected to be able to do some kind of statistical control work, which was absolutely unheard of 15 or 20 years ago. Right. If you look at books like um, The New Basic Skills, you'll see that there is now extensive testing of workers coming into manufacturing industries, and it will be difficult for high school dropouts to get those manufacturing See, jobs. I don't think the public recognizes that no, change. No, I don't think they do, but it's, it's very powerfully there because our factories are more productive and they're using more technology, so we now need workers who know how to use that technology. I think uh, we need to focus on job creation at the low end, but we also need to understand the low end needs to be a stepping stone to something better. Unlike many of my colleagues on the left, I actually think these low-wage jobs that I studied are important and that they provide an opportunity for people to get in the front door and that that is not a crime and that the employers who offer these jobs should not be vilified or treated as if they're simply out to exploit the workforce. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. Right. The problem comes when people try to platform off those jobs into something better. That's where the breakdown occurs. And how would we go about fixing that, that break? I make some suggestions in the book about ways to bring employers together who, are, who have both low-wage jobs to offer and better jobs to offer to try to create what I call an employer consortium that I think would be a very low-cost switching system or right. boot camp, if you like, so that workers who've proven themselves in jobs like these fast food jobs can be passed along, so to speak, to employers who have something better to offer mm -hmm. and actually have to invest a lot more in training their workers, hence to have recommendations that they trust from fellow employers at the low wage end will ensure to a greater degree that employers up the scale will have people to bet on 
that well, are a good bet. Well, sure, the employee uh, that you mentioned, Kaisha, who put in five years and comes to work on That's her right. holiday would be a prime employee uh, exactly. uh, subject to training. But if you as look well. at who Kaisha knows in her private life, who right. could help, as she says, hook her up to a better job. It's interesting what you find. Yeah. She knows lots of people who have jobs just like hers. Right. Those people cannot help Hook her, her up. move up. They can help her remain employed if right. she should lose the job she has, but they can't help her move up. She also knows people who have much better jobs. Her grandmother has a much better job. Her mother is on welfare, but her grandmother works for the post office, hmm. and her grandmother is a homeowner. And this is something I found not unusual among the low-wage workers in the inner city. They are not from, necessarily, persistently poor families. Right. They are the downwardly mobile younger generation whose grandparents sense. benefited from the increase in the public sector in the 1960s and the Fair Wage Act. Um, so they they do, she does know people who have much better jobs, many of her relatives do, but they're in sectors that are shrinking. So the fact that her grandmother has a better job means Kaisha has real aspirations and knows what it would look like if she had a much better job. But her idea of a much better job is Con Edison or the MTA or the post office, the places where her older relatives made it into the black working class. We uh, at uh, Community Service Society have been very uh, concerned with, uh, there's been a move towards downsizing in municipal government that has targeted uh, just those areas where African American and Latino workers have just broken in, right. particularly in the social services and health care, uh, while police and fire have not been touched, actually have seen some modest growth. Mm -hmm. And those, of course, are, have long traditions of not accepting people from different groups. Uh, so it, it, it this really... This is a very serious problem, as you say, for the people who hold those jobs right. in public service. When you then look at new generations, they don't even they have, don't a, have chance a chance to get those jobs. But they want them, and they know what a good job looks right. like because they have friends and relatives who have them. Anyway, the point is, I think if you were to rely solely on Kaisha's private network, you would not see much upward mobility for her. Right. But if her employer could pass her along and got some modest compensation for doing so, to an employer up the road who has a better job to offer, that employer up the road would have gotten a recommendation he or she could really trust. And, and a worker who had really proven herself. And in exchange, the uh, Kaisha's boss would be able to offer the next person who knocks on the door a future that might not be in his firm, but might be in another firm. So I, de I describe at some length right. this system of employer consortiums that I think could help. And are you going to follow up your 300 at some point when you yes. get more funding? Or what's, I, I how is that? I actually am following them Okay, up what, what's happening with that? Well, we did a restudy of both the, the workers and the job seekers right. four years after my first contact with right. them. The good news is about a third of these people are doing very well. They're earning more than $10 an hour. That's more than double the wages right. they had when I first met them. About a third are in steady state. They're still employed, they're still steadily employed, but they have not seen a lot of wage growth. Mm -hmm. And about a third are in trouble. trouble. They're bumping along the bottom of unemployment, of welfare receipt, and low wage work. The group that's at the top, I like to focus on them because I think it's yeah. important for people to know that there are success stories out there. But when we look at what made them successful, we find that either they were promoted internally mm -hmm. in the fast food industry, which is very good about this, or they found a connection that helped them get a unionized, low to medium skilled job. So now they're working as porters in the porters union. Well, that's a unionized yep. job. That's $14 yep. an hour and, and that benefits. carries benefits. Um, so the most successful of them were able to hook on to a unionized job, which returns us to the question of unions and what happens to unions in the city. If those jobs should end up being less unionized, I would expect to see those wages fall. Oh. But for the group that actually found unionized low to medium skilled jobs, this is a success story. And as you look around the country, are, are you seeing, is New York being replicated in the other places you look? Are you seeing the same kinds of uh, scenarios or is the labor market so tight in other parts that you're really seeing wage growth? You do see wage growth in places like Milwaukee, which right. have under 2% unemployment. Although even in inner city Milwaukee, you see problems. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Andrew Cuomo and HUD released a report just two weeks ago 
called uh, Places Left Behind in the New Economy. And it documents the fact that we still have a significant number of communities in the United States, I believe they focus on 150 in particular, mm -hmm. where there is still significant poverty and some evidence that poverty is increased rather than being rocketed along with the uh, growing economy. There is no question that for all of us, a growing economy is the best possible medicine for the working poor or for welfare right. recipients. But it doesn't evenly affect everyone. Affect everyone. What about language barriers? Uh, talking about, uh, did you see in your 300 in the follow-up problems of people who were having yes, difficulty? Yes, I, I studied a lot of Latino workers, Dominicans right. and Puerto Ricans here in New York. Um, they were quite successful at getting jobs. They were sought after by employers. In particular, immigrants were sought after. Mm -hmm. This is true of black immigrants and it's true of Latino immigrants. Employers right. really think they are high quality workers and, um, work and have a powerful work ethic. But when we look at their mobility patterns, that's when we begin to see some of the language barrier problems. Now, in some communities, like Washington Heights, for example, you can be almost a monolingual Spanish speaker and move up quite a ways because there's a whole enclave there of professionals who right. are Spanish speakers, teachers, Pretty social young. workers, private industry, factories, right. and so on. But if you, if you need to break out of that enclave and you don't speak English fluently, it can be a problem. Nonetheless, most of the people that I was studying were aware of this, and they were taking English as second language mm. classes, and those classes are highly oversubscribed. So it's not as though immigrant workers and uh, non-English speakers are unaware of the barrier and seek to address it. What you raised, education. What about continuing education for this group? How do, how do they feel? What's education the is extremely important to this group, and I don't think that's what most people would have predicted no. if they were thinking about inner city fast food workers. Right. Over half of the people in this book had high school diplomas already. The half that didn't, in general, were enrolled either in high school still yes, okay. or in a GED program or an English as a Second Language program. However, the increases in tuition that have affected mm. the CUNY system do make it very difficult for this population to realize the dream of higher education. It's, it, so it's not their lack of interest in it. It's no, just on the contrary. In fact, many of them are very frustrated about their inability to go back to school. Those who have children are particularly in trouble. They really are not structurally able to go back to school, but they're very well aware that they need to, and they speak about the aspiration to do so. Um, anything we could do to open the gates rather than close the gates of higher education would vastly benefit these people. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. The nation's poor do not need their values engineered. They do not need lessons about the dignity of work. What they need is help to overcome the barriers of race and class, the negative valuation of their work experience, the simple lack of enough good jobs to go around. So says Catherine S. Newman in her book, no shame in my game. I couldn't have said it better. This is David R. Jones, your host on the Urban Agenda. Thank you for watching. To comment on the Urban Agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.